guess begin talking about monsters cards. Literally FTK protect. Yeah, yeah. I guess the natural first place to start is the leaders. So this is Aridon. Half as many points as Woodland. Same number of mulligans, but the immune lets you do stuff with like uh, Aridons and series. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like all the scorches running around. That immune isn't actually all that immune. It matters for stuff like professional. It matters for like when your opponent's trying to kill things over multiple turns. But like just a really tall unit seems almost as immune as something that was made immune by Aridon in a lot of cases. <laughs> Wilson, what the fuck? <laughs> Wait. Never mind. You're all you're all being silly. Yeah, so generally the Aridon decks were like playing a Sabbath or they were playing a Siri Dash or they were playing a Siri. And they were giving it immune. And I guess in Aridon's case, it made it particularly hard to interact with, because normally dealing damage to an Aridon and just like knocking it off the tallest unit ends up being significant. But for most other cases, I felt like it wasn't too different than just like giving it a bunch of points with Woodland. Most removal is just damage. Speaking of Woodland, though, Woodland is basically a full extra card. 8 is a pretty significant number of points. It's definitely more than the average card. And it's all burst, too. So your last play... If you get last, say, with Woodland Spirit, you get to play, like, something between 12 and 20 points without your opponent being able to interact with them. Yeah, Woodland's a, Woodland's a pretty good leader. I would like to try experimenting with just, like, this Aridon deck. Just playing Woodland over Aridon, though. I think that's kind of interesting. It just doesn't seem like the immune matters quite that much to be worth the whole four points you're giving up. I'm going to have to reset my filters, right? Yeah. You can't sleep. That's unfortunate. Uh, Unseen Elder. I really like the design of these on round start refresh things. Unseen Elder, uh, Morvran, Eithne. Just because they sort of give you an incentive into playing into all three rounds, which is something that was kind of missing in Old Gwent. While the hand size limit is one thing that prevents dry passes, abilities like this are also really good at preventing dry passes. These kind of decks are incentivized to win round one so that they can get the best use of their ability in all three rounds. Where... So like you still want to have a long round so that you can win round one in order to force a round two and round three that your opponent actually has to play. You're not just like all in on long rounds because you actually will have a stronger three round plan than most opponents because this is worth like an extra five points or with Eithne is worth I don't even know how much in some situations. With uh, Morvran, I mean Morvran's worth an extra three to four but when you're buffing like a Siri or a Siri dash it ends up being significantly more. Yeah, I really like these types of cards. Unfortunately, with Unseen Elder, the two mulligans kind of holds it back. As well as just like the whole Death Wish mechanic that ends up being more about making sure that you can draw all your synergies in combination with one another. No Happery yet? Yeah, it's still under review. Wish they had more of these types of leaders. I just wish they made Unseen Elder a little bit better. Like, this could easily have three mulligans, and nothing would really change. Because, like, what's triggering a Deathwish worth? Probably less than Morvran. Like, sure, Morvran's 3 to 4 points, and triggering a Deathwish can be, like, 5 with Harpy Egg. Maybe, like, 6 with Succubus. Maybe a little more with Imperial Manticore. But Morvran keeping stuff alive is worth some harder-to-define number of points as well. What leader do I identify with the most? I... Don't think I really identify with any any leaders. 
Aside from balancing around Mulligan's consistency, for some reason, you think leaders are one of the things they do really well? Yeah, yeah. I think the leader design in most situations, aside from like some stuff like Usurper, and I don't really like the design of Aridon. I think the leader abilities are all really cool. But like I I, I really don't like the balancing around mulligan instead of provisions. It just seems kinda weird. If I had to choose who would it be? Personally, you're in a rock is queen. <laughs> Uh, I, I like King Bran. Let's go with King Bran. Whenever an allied unit is destroyed during your turn, spawn an Arrakis drone and summon it to an allied row. This card is so fucking cool. <laughs> I tried so many times to make consume work. There's so much cool stuff you can do. You can use this to like set up bone talismans, set up froth, set up glusty warps. Uh, make your consume effects have more value. There's so much stuff that this enables. Unfortunately, A, the card Forktail is everywhere, and Forktail just ends up being really good when you're trying to go wide with the Rockus drones. But I think more importantly, the one mulligan for a leader that's going to be built around having high synergy effects just does not, doesn't really facilitate <laughs> something that's good. Uh, I love this card though. This loses the most out of like being balanced around mul by mulligans. If this just costs like some number of provisions, some reasonable number of provisions, instead of like literally not having mulligans for round three ever if you want to play Witchers and Roach. not being able to have any kind of like reasonable thinning to dig through your deck. Because that's the difference, right? Like when you have four mulligans and you go into round three, as long as you're able to thin to like four or five cards, you're going to be able to see almost every card in your deck. However, when you're playing a low mulligan leader, not only are you not able to uh, like see as many cards in round three with your mulligans, you're also not able to thin as much because you can't afford to play Witchers, Roach, and Wild Hunt Riders in your deck or anything like that. You're really cut short by the amount of thinning cards that you can add because you can't afford to mulligan them in round one. So, it, like, the negatives sort of double dip on you in terms of being able to find your cards. Most always win versus a Rockus Queen, but one time you remember you got bamboozled by the Rockus Behemoth finisher and lost that game. Oh, man. Yeah, I like the, the passive leader abilities too. Like, not ones that you have to activate. I'm still a little concerned with the, like, the whole design space of being able to, like, always have access to your leader ability the same turn that you play a card. It feels really scary. I think we saw a little bit of that with how good it is, how good it can be with, like, the Eithnes and Scorches this season. But, like, even if just, like, the Drow Herald thing was a little bit better, or the Francesca with Aglaes was a little bit better, it just seems really scary always having access to something that you can do the same turn as something else. Like Calvay into Emissary into Regis, something like that. Just like these huge potential blow up, blow out things. These passive leaders like Arrakis Queen don't really have that same like threat. They're just kind of always there and you build your deck around them always being there. You're not going to like exploit some big swingy thing with like two plays that your opponent can't interact in between. Yeah, I wish we had more passive leaders. These are sweet. If you draw all your cards, don't get bled and don't get controlled, consume is the nuts. We were playing a consume list that was pretty good at not getting controlled a couple days ago. Uh, Magus suggested just like cutting the Slyzards and the Barbagazis, and this actually worked better than I thought it would. Just like you don't care if anything dies. The only thing, like obviously you don't want to get like scorched or ignite or anything. But like a couple damage effects aren't really going to do anything to you. You see much every deck has tall unit killers. One isn't really enough if you get a long round. 
you really need like a professional and an Igni, or you need to line up a Scorch or something like that. I think Gwent should add trap cards. Gwent has trap cards. They're literally called trap cards. Old spear tip. <laughs> the old 13 for 15. So, at first glance, like, 13 for 15 isn't that exciting, but there's two reasons why this is, like, a totally reasonable card to include in your deck. A, it's very card efficient. While it's not very provision efficient, necessarily, the fact that you're only using one of your cards and getting 13 out of it is worth some somewhat difficult to... Like, exactly define amount. One thing that I think a lot of people are overlooking when they're looking at homecoming cards is they're just uh, bleh, they're just comparing convision provisions to points. When in reality, it's still somewhat important to just be able to play efficient cards at all points in the game. Every time you play, like, a really cheap card and you're not mulliganing it, you end up losing what, points, right? Instead of playing like like an average card, you're playing like a four. Old Spear Tip is just always going to increase the number of points that you're playing on average, as long as you're able to mulligan your cheaper cards. Because once you play Old Spear Tip, you're so far above like where you would otherwise be. I don't know if what I said just made any sense, but it made sense in my head. <laughs> uh, also. While 13 for 15 isn't so exciting, you have other cards, like uh, Ghoul and Azrael to capitalize off that. You tip in a way it makes your mulligans worth more points. Yeah! Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's also, you only get to play 16 cards over the course of a game. So you want all of the cards that you play to be worth as many points as possible. And that's not just about jamming as many points per provisions. There's a little bit more to it than that. And that's card efficiency. Like, if you have a deck that is filled with just, let's say, 7 point for 7 provision cards, you're going to do worse in a game than someone that has more of a split, because they can mulligan their cheaper cards and only play their more expensive cards. Even if you're playing, like, 8s for 7. You're still getting worse rate than someone playing 4s for 4s and 13s for 15s in a lot of cases. Anyway, Ghoul and Azrael. So once you have Spear Tip in your graveyard, let, let's say that for whatever reason, these two points that you paid with this provision exchange, you want to get those back. Once Spear Tip's in your graveyard, and you, ha you, you play an Azrael, on this Azrael now, you're getting 15 for 9, so you're making that up with a little bit of interest as well. So like even without... While 13 for 15 is probably closer to break-even than it looks at a glance, because the numbers don't really line up, once you add in Azrael and Ghoul, the numbers are actually looking just like very good. And that's one of the strengths of the, the Tall Woodland deck I started seeing a lot of... play throughout the season. Decided Hensel is going to be really good after the patch, getting another mulligan. He pulled off a turn and swung around 80 points with him earlier. It was pretty fun. How did you swing 80 points? Is it like Sabrina Revenant? Anyway, Ruhin. This guy is the heart and soul of like the hard Arrakis Queen consume deck. Monster has a few ways to make sure that you get to play this multiple times. A, you have World Creed and Algafar to dig for it. You have Corinthia so that you can play multiple copies of it. You have Renew so that you can play multiple copies of it. You have Whispering Killix so you can play multiple copies of it. And you can sort of build a deck around just consuming this as many times as possible in every round. If you want to compare this to a card from Old Gwent, you could compare it to the Old Olgeard. Except since numbers were like multiplied by two, this is something more similar to an Olgeard that was already Mandraked, where the average card value before was something like 12, now the average card value is something like 6 or 7.
But yeah, like every every four points that you're getting off Rugeen is worth significantly more than like whatever five points you would have gotten off of just all year before. Uh, I mean Dumbledore with 18. Ow. <laughs> you have 18 charges, does it really count? For those of you watching on YouTube, it is the uh, immune Visigoda 18 charges to Tridem infantry, two potions onto infantry, all Nenica charges onto infantry, summoning circle, pool knight, and the knight. Yeah, I like Rukin. Uh I was worried about this card being potentially too good. But because the metagame was so control heavy, it's so hard to get a Slyzard to stick, and Slyzard is one of the best ways to abuse Rukin. So it ended up being fine. Going forward, I could still see this card maybe being a problem in the future. But there being so many ways to replay it. Even if locks become popular, if like lock is the main answer to consume, it's not hard for the consume deck to just slot in some Ahaka males. It already has Corinthia, Whispering Hillock, Renew. It has ways to deal with it getting locks just built in. And if locks are becoming more prevalent, just like teching an extra Mahaka male or two. Kind of just solves all the lock problems as well. Yeah, this card's scary. I'm kind of glad it exists for now, but we'll see. Versus lock, it gets totally shut down. There's other point slamming deck that still falls behind. Uh, I never really had problems with other point slamming decks. The only times that I was really losing with consume is when we were getting over controlled. Like, we'd lose to Scorches getting lined up or Ignis getting lined up. Or when we were playing Slyzards, our Slyzards is just constantly dying and not being able to consume anything. When consume isn't interacted with, it's disgusting. And even then, you can usually beat like one or two locks. Just because you have the, the Whispering Hillock, the Renew, all that stuff. Also, the issue of not going on the same row. Yeah, but there's ways of dealing with that, right? You have Cyclops, you have Selena Harpy, you have Karan. You have other ways to consume it as well. And it's eventually going to go back on the same row as the Slyzard. And our super broken versus consume. Yeah, it's it's not fun having your Rockus drones shut down by Revenants. <sighs> yeah, Ruheen. Probably the, one of the cooler monster cards. Weavis Incantation. Deploy, melee, consume unit in your hand, draw a card. This card does a, a few really cool things for specifically the Tall Woodland deck. One, it enables your ghouls, especially like in round three. So if your opponent lemons is you in round three, as long as you held on to Weavis, you can still make a ghoul live. So if you just keep like a ghoul and Azrael, a tall unit Weavis, your opponent guns lemons is you into round one. You can just Azrael a guy from your graveyard. Weave is one of your tall guys out of hand and then play a ghoul on the tall guy, and it's like the lemons got them just a few points. Uh, I think that was one of the main reasons this card saw play early on, and it just kind of never fell out of the deck. The value on this isn't crazy. Like, if you assume that the average card in your deck is worth something like 7 points, you're getting 10 for 11. And, like, that's... it's fine, it's not the worst. It's pretty efficient, it digs through your deck, it thins. But I think the main reason this card was seeing play was to disrupt lemons. Or to play around lemons. <laughs> For its sack. Trigger all allies' death dish abilities. Oh. So if you have two harpy eggs in play, you get... 10 points out of your 10. Ideally, you have more than 2 RP eggs in play. The ceiling on this card is kind of silly, but the problem is that if you're playing towards the ceiling on this card, your Death Wish deck is probably worse off for it, because you don't have a good balance of ways to trigger Death Wishes and Death Wish units. So you're going to be really weak in all the games where you don't draw Ritual Sacrifice, or when your opponent's killing your Death Wish units by themselves, which happens in more matchups than you think. Kirby with a tier 1 sub... Thank you for the seven months. I appreciate it. Uh, so, I played this like my very first Deathwish decks, and I very quickly cut it. It just wasn't the kind of card that you want. Mm 
Nah. Nagafar. Look at two random gold cards from your deck. Play one, place the other on top. Old Gales. I'm down for Old Gales. The only issue that I have with Nagafar is that be in a lot of decks, I mean, at least in Monster decks that I was playing, I didn't have very many mulligans. I was usually playing Unseen Elder or Rockus Queen, those are the decks that I was trying to tinker with. And when you don't have very many mulligans, and you don't have trackers, it's really easy to either accidentally or be forced to brick your Nagafar. This card also has like the kind of weird paradox where you're incentivized to hold this until round 3 because you have the fewest number of golds left so you're more likely to see what you want. But it also wants you to play it early so that you can find both of the gold cards that you play. You can use cards like Poet or Weavis to kind of play around that and be able to do both in round 3. But then you're playing cards like Poet or Weavis and... Eh. Yeah, generally I was just playing this card as like a second Royal Decree, a second like cheaper Royal Decree. It was good in Consume, let me find my Ruhin, let me find my Renew. I guess notably this can find special cards, which Royal Decree can't do. Poet, yeah, I mean, Poet's... Poet's not the best, as we discussed before. Probably two or three provisions overcosted. Yes, yeah, so if you're looking for a special card, which aside from Renew, I'm not really sure. I guess Whitsack. Whispering Hill, like if your deck's built around that kind of stuff. There's not a ton of special cards you want to look for, but if you do need to find a special card, Nagafar is sort of a tutor for the special, which you otherwise can't do with Decree. Uh, for Big Woodland, Double Cross versus Nagafar Opinions. Uh... I mean, I'm pretty sure generally you would want double cross. No, I would need. I think it depends maybe on the individual woodland list. It seems like most of the time the card that you're going to want is the tallest unit in your deck. But it sort of depends how redundant your golds are. Because in that deck in particular, you'd kind of want to roll the Naglfar early, so that you can try to find your Azrael with it. Like, you'll be shown one card that you want to play now, and hopefully one card that you want to play later. And there's really not that many cards that you want to play later, so it's unlikely that you see two cards that you have to play late. Also, I guess ADC will never really find your Azrael. If you have Naglfar in round 3 and you haven't found your Azrael yet, Naglfar is pretty likely to give you that. I see someone... Someone else got number one this season, this year's the fifth faction. I'm not surprised, but yeah, I, I did see that. I did see that. All the factions were definitely playable this season. Especially early on. Like, if you didn't mind the queue times, I don't think it would have been that hard to get, like, 2600s within the first, like, two or three weeks. And then pushing them from there is just pushing them from there. Yeah, as NR was Draug. Goal Yacht. Opponent summons the lowest unit from your deck in the opposite row. So, again, this is sort of the same thing as Old Spear Tip. It's a 10 for 10, which isn't super exciting, except the more expensive cards get, the harder it is to get 1 for 1 on your provisions. And it also is the same thing as Old Spear Tip, and you get to double dip with your Azrael, though it's a little bit less extreme the, the cheaper the card gets. So here, like you're initially getting a 10 for 10, and then on your Azrael, you're getting 12 for 9. Or 11 for 8 on Ghoul. I like it. I think more Monster decks probably should have been playing just like Goliath Azrael. The opportunity cost on putting Azrael in your deck is fairly low. Your opponent's usually going to play a Frenzy Dao, you're usually going to play a Frenzy Dao. So worst case, you're getting 9 for 9 most of the time. Maybe maybe 8 for 9. If you get like super unlucky. But you also have the potential of getting this fairly easy 12 for 9. 
And there's not really much cost in putting Goliath in your deck. Balancing Factions is the best since you started playing. Uh, I'm not sure that it still is. It's just earlier in the season. It's a lot easier to get away with playing less refined decks. Because everyone's decks are less refined. Like, I don't think Full Test is... I don't want to say it's unplayable on ladder, but it feels a lot worse to play on ladder after Crocker got popular. That matchup is so bad. This guy dying is not the end of the world. Oh yeah, his death wish isn't relevant. <laughs> Most of the time your opponent's getting one point when this dies. It's and, and it's never going to die. It's a ten point unit. Old Spear Tip at Sleep. So, we said how the worst case for this guy is when he dies and you basically got 9 for 10. This guy just is a 9 for 10. <laughs> yeah, uh... You also get less points on your Ghoul and Azrael with this guy. If you're using Thrive units, he's a way to make your Thrive units bigger. But aside from that, you will always play Goliath before you even consider playing Old Spear Tip. This card's not exciting, you just play it if you think you have to. Morvud, boost all beast allies by one. This is the kind of card where if there were more playable beasts, this would be kind of interesting. It doesn't ask much. To be good. If your whole deck is beasts, and it's just asking you to have four beasts in play. Generally, so the Germain cows are all beasts, right? The big problem with that, though, is that since you're overpaying for Germain, you're going to want to do multiple things with those beasts. Like, just going Germain into Morvud isn't really a reasonable thing. Since you're paying three points to get the extra bodies off Germain, it's like you're getting one extra point on the Germain. And since you're paying four on the Morvud... You're still not really getting great rate. Yeah, there needs to be either more beasts or more beast synergy. If you'd ever really want to consider playing Morvud. But once you do want to play Morvud, this is like a, a six point Vesemir, right? Vesemir is, I think, a four for ten. And the only thing Vesemir does better than Morvud is the Witcher archetype is just more supported. Kill Tullus. Every turn on turn end, destroy the lowest unit on the side with the most units. <laughs> this deck was so much fun. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm pretty sure I posted highlights of the Kill Tullus deck. If you haven't seen those, you should watch that. This deck was so funny. If your opponent doesn't know what's going on and they give you like a moderate round three and you just go like turn one Kiltalus, or not turn one Kiltalus Aridin, but like they, they play something, you go Kiltalus Aridin and then you go like Avalok, they don't kill the Avalok, then you go Slyzard <laughs> and you Avalok the Slyzard and you just never have more than two units in play. And both your units are taller than anything that they can make. <laughs> deck was silly. It loses to Scorch every time. But that deck was silly. Uh, yeah, I don't really know what to say about this. It was really cheesy. Gills. Whenever you play a unit with Deathwish, trigger its Deathwish ability. So there were two schools around this card. I guess three schools, though one of them wasn't really justifiable. There was, you play this card in Aridin, you try to win round one with other means, and then you play Giels in round three and win with an Aridin to Giels. And the problem with that is when you got bled, you didn't know when you should pull the trigger on your Giels. If you play your Giels too early into round two, then your opponent can just pass. If you play the Giels too late in round two, you're not getting any value out of it. And you ended up stuck in this weird paradox where your deck was just bad if you lost round one. Then there was, you play this in every Deathwish deck because triggering Deathwishes twice is really good. 
But if you're playing this as an Unseen Elder and you can't give it immune, then, well, A, your deck is a pile of Deathwish abilities that your opponent often doesn't want to kill, so they're going to have extra removal in their hand anyway to kill this. But also, he's range locked, so he's still just... Even if they don't have removal and they just have, like, a movement effect, so often you're just going to play a 5 for 10 that either dies or gets moved and has no ability. Be a great card if it wasn't Rolak. I don't even know about that. It would be better for sure. Especially the Aridin list would be better, because then you couldn't Novellan the Immune Gales off of the range draw. But I think the main application for this card, and the only deck that I thought it was kind of reasonable in, or at least the only concept that I thought it was reasonable in, is I was playing an Aridin Deathwish deck that turn one of round one would just gum the Gales to force my opponent out of round one. So I could win round three with just something else they didn't see coming. In that case, I was trying to win the round with Dragon's Dreams. And that worked... kind of well. When I was playing that deck, was like point and ladder when people started putting Scout in their deck for no reason. So I ended up losing a few games to just like random Scouts. But the plan went pretty well. Like We were pretty consistently winning round one with the Giels. It's just the the round three plan wasn't quite there. Because once you lose your use your hero ballot, uh, hero ability to win round one, you're sort of like down a card in a way. At least down a card's worth of points, sort of. So you really need that extra finisher to be worth its weight. That's what she's out of control, this guy can stick. Yeah. But it has to stick for multiple turns, and killing us over two turns isn't difficult. Also, like, the fundamental problem with this kind of card in a Deathwish deck is that if you're playing Deathwish, you're trying to prey on control. Because the whole point of Deathwish is that your stuff doesn't die to removal. As soon as you put a card in your deck that dies to removal this harshly, you're sort of invalidating the whole point of playing your deck. <laughs> troll of Vergen. <laughs> uh, when I was playing like some really greedy consume lists, this card is pretty cool on some really greedy consume lists. When it lives, this thing can very easily get to like thirty plus points, and you can uh, you can Corinthia to have multiple of them, and often this is tough to just like actually kill. Because you're going to put this down, and the same turn you're going to use like a Slyzard Consume, and then maybe like a couple of uh, Karan Consumes. And even like a Corinthian one can very easily come down at like 6 or 7 points. Here for the record, you hate Warlock cards. Um, I think in some cases when the engine is really powerful if it doesn't get disrupted, having it be Warlock gives an additional like interaction method. That's probably a good thing. Yeah, the issue with this card in Consume is just that Consume either won't be consistent or won't have the provisions to play this. Because there's a bunch of high provision cards that you really just need to slot into Consume in order to be viable. Having stuff like routine access in every round means that you have to play like Royal Decree, Corinthian, Renew, Ruhin himself. You're going to want to play K. Ran, he's 9 provisions, and all of a sudden, you kind of can't afford to play anything expensive anymore. And 10 is pretty expensive. Once there are maybe more cheap cards that support the consume archetype, maybe you can fit in some more expensive payoff cards. But for right now, at least, I don't think that potential's there. As cool as this card is, and as, as swingy as this card can be. I particularly enjoy balancing melee locked cards with reach. Reach three only. Or, or, or Gimpy Gerwin, I guess. <laughs> Fuck Gimpy Gerwin. <laughs> Mispus Tribute. Play an organic card from your deck. 
I mean, it's a two-day, right? All these cards are kind of the same. It really depends how important it is to see the organic card that you're looking for. What are the organics and monsters? So you can use Wispus to find Ritzak, which is definitely a card that you build around. Uh, Whispering Hillock, which a little bit less so. Parasite, Hades Feast, Predatory Dive, Arrakis Nest. Like, if you really want a hard build around Ritzak, I guess you would play Wispus. A good synergy with Forktail she shall has. Yeah, definitely. But if you just want synergy with Forktail, there's a Fork Provision card that does that for you. It's good for A-Rush abuse. Did you see anyone on ladder playing A Rush at all this season? Or are you just saying that like in the future, maybe we'll want to be A rushing? But yeah, I, I am just looking at monsters cards. I don't know if there's any neutrals. One Hillock and Zoln. Oh, true, true. I guess you could also, if you just really want to thin your deck for whatever reason, you can Wispus into Hillock into Wispus and thin out two organics. <laughs> it sounds really expensive, but you can do it. Morntart order. Banish all units in your graveyard who self buy one for each. We saw A Rush quite a bit in PTR, but nonsense release. Yeah, it just seems eight provisions. Especially with the risk of drawing A Rush in round three and not having enough mulligans on it. The risk just didn't seem there. And there's nothing that you really wanted to A Rush either. Banish all units from graveyard self for money. This is another like PTR only thing. In PTR, the Arrakis tokens weren't doomed, Jermaine tokens weren't doomed, uh, Harpy Egg tokens weren't doomed. It died when the whole round one doesn't matter meme was dispelled. Oh true. That's also true. Uh the thing is, like, even in PTR. When Arrakis tokens were doomed, uh, weren't doomed, this thing still had problems. You still had to combo with Avalok or the Potion in a deck that either didn't have other artifacts or didn't have other thinning, or didn't have enough thinning to like guarantee your combo. So there were a bunch of games where you'd have Morntart, but no Avalok, and you would just play a 1 for 10. It would get Forktailed or pinged with Eichne or something like that. And even when you gave it immune with Avalok, it, it got forktailed or something similar. Where catted, lacerated, dragon streamed. Went to it was seven to eight provisions. It sells the problem of dying too much. Like it has to be worthwhile to use Avalok or risk playing the Zeal Potion. And I don't know how you're getting it big enough to make it worth that risk, even if this is fewer provisions. I mean, I'm sure there's a provision number where this card just becomes, like, really swingy and binary. But I don't think you want to design the card so that it's good at that point. Because <laughs> that's not really a fun card to play with. Yeah, I'd really have to see how big Graveyard's got when you're playing an average deck. I imagine they don't get more than, like, what, 13 to 15 cards, maybe? Even that's probably generous. Because, what, you play 16 cards over the course of a game. No tokens go to the Graveyard. Very few things go to the Graveyard other than the cards that you play. So if round three is, let's say round three is eight cards long... 
you're assuming you have an eight eight cards in your graveyard. It's a pretty shitty Mortart. Would a one strength immune that boosted every time an ally unit died be too good? Yes. Well, it depends how many provisions, but that would be very strong and consume. Like, being immune is a huge deal. All of a sudden, your Glusty Warps are getting an extra point, your Forktails are getting an extra point for each unit, your... Like, all your consumes are worth an additional point. And when you're trying to do that every single turn, it's basically like a one-point-per-turn engine that sometimes gets a crazy number of points with a Forktail. It's sort of like an immune Varan Warrior. But like, there's definitely a provision number you could give that where it's not playable. And it's probably not even that high. Frightener Dormant. <laughs> uh, this card's... This card's cool, it's just bad. Unless you're triggering this the same turn that you're playing it. Since you need three allied units to die, you're probably not playing this in a deck that has a lot of other artifacts. You're probably trying to jam it into something like Consume. In which case, it's probably the only card in your deck that's giving your opponent's Frenzy Dao a target. Uh, would Mornsheart even be played now if the tokens weren't doomed? No, that's what I was saying. Like, it wasn't even that good in PTR. It died too much. The one thing that Warntart does that's interesting that She Troll doesn't is that it gives you a short round. Where consume short round is generally like hope you have renew and two consumes for your Ruhin, something like that. If you're able to have like Avalok Mornart and your Mornart's worth like twenty or thirty points. Then all of a sudden now consume has a scary short round and a scary long round. But it needs to be a matchup where you can expect your guy to live. The Frightener that comes Yeah, the Frightener that comes out is immune, but this thing never lives. Short rounds haven't seen one of those since beta. <laughs> it's amazing how few people bleed consume. <laughs> No one has any respect for consume. You get so many dumb wins just off people dry passing you into round three, and they try to play a ten card round against consume and get destroyed. Yeah, if Frenzy Dao wasn't so prevalent, or if, at least if artifact removal wasn't so prevalent, and particularly Frenzy Dao, this card would be at least interesting. Unfortunately, it's it can't even be interesting because it just dies. Sort of the same problem Summoning Circle has. Of course, this guy gets totally kind of an artifact move like it gets off. It's a great cool or Azrael target later. Oh, that's true. I guess it's not doomed. Yeah. The problem is that that just doesn't really matter because the risk is just too great. Cool, a Frightener transforms in your hand if you kill three of your units in the same turn. I mean, that's just a different designed card. The whole point is that like it's vulnerable initially. Kind of, except it's an artifact. I don't know, the, the, the design of this card is weird. <laughs> like, after it cracks, it's immune, but before it cracks, it's an artifact, which is technically hard to interact with. So it's supposed to be like this difficult to interact with 12 for 9. It has some conditions. I don't know, it's just kind of weird. Do people experiment with it in Woodland Control? Uh, I think so. I think I saw some people playing it, but it just never... The deck didn't have enough units. If 
you control the highest unit, damage unit by two, cooldown one, reach two. So this was the card that people finally started building Aridin around near the end of the season. And by near the end of the season, I mean like the last, what, like two or three weeks? Two weeks? Three weeks is a long time. I mean, probably like two weeks. I don't know. Uh, it felt like it got scorched a lot when I was playing it. That might have just been the MMR that I was at. I certainly wasn't playing the deck optimally. I was really scared of playing Elmerith into round one a lot of the time. I definitely should have been doing that more. Uh, the main concern that I think I had with Elmerith was that it seemed too easy for your opponent to just go over the top and play a unit that was just bigger than anything you could put into play, and all of a sudden you just have this 9-point dude that you wasted your hero power on that doesn't do anything. Bouncing Ilmerith on purpose? Now I am. I don't know, when... So we tried an Ilmerith list... Like, shortly after the hotfix. I don't even know if I still have it. Is it this one? Yeah, and then eventually just turned into this. <laughs> we played like four games in a row where our opponent just went over the top of our Ilmerith. So we just swapped it out for Yen Khan's, played Mastercrafted Spears, and it ended up feeling a lot better. <laughs> uh, I don't know. At least you can't brick this card. Even when you're getting one point per turn instead of two points per turn, at least you're still getting one point per turn. And sometimes you just get stupid value off of the end. I don't know. With Crohn's, you can play around side with super well. Yeah, maybe that... That's probably what I was missing before. I played another Aridin deck. Yeah, I played Malegion's List from the Are You Gwent tournament, and we did better with this one. We didn't get like thrown over the top quite as much. It still happened, but nowhere near as often. Hermia, monsters, Karen. The six for five consume guys, or five for six consume guys, price a consume at one. But getting the bulk consumes and like being able to choose to consume later makes this card way more valuable in certain decks. In consume, this is probably the best consumer. And with Corinthia allowing you to play it multiple times, in some matchups that are heavy removal based, you can sort of build your entire plan just around having a couple of Karans. You can go like Corinthia Karan. Renew your Corinthia, play another Karan, play your Karan from hand. And that gives you nine consumes that are all zealed. That you can split up however you want. You can end up eating a bunch of Ruhines with just like Karan, Renew, Corinthia. Eat Saber Green. Yeah, I don't know exactly who came up with it. The list that I copied off of was. Religions. I don't know exactly whose list it was. A lot of people were playing it. Yeah, Karan. Cool and consume. Less cool for Deathwish. Oh, the reason it matters for consume is that the because you're playing Ruhines, being able to split up the consumes matters a lot. You don't want to use all the consumes at once. With Deathwish, it's a little bit more important that you're just efficiently triggering your Deathwishes, and this card isn't that efficient at making consumes. If we were just to like value like the consumes at the same rate that you're getting on the fives for sixes, you're paying an extra two points on your three consumes than you would otherwise. 
and while you're still being card efficient, you're either going to build your deck in a way that when you don't draw Karen, you're not going to have enough consumes, or when you draw Karen, you're going to have you'll often have too many consumes. Because it also just throws off that ratio by being three different consumes at once. So for Death Wish, I'd much rather play Cyclops and Harpies. In just like hard consume, this card is bonkers. Still a better Ritzak and Death Wish? Uh, probably, yeah. It has points attached to it. The one thing Ritzak does better is that Ritzak allows you to then consume your cards again, where this doesn't. The thing is, if you're playing Ritzak, you probably don't have a good balance of consume effects anyway, because you're trying to maximize value off Ritzak. I think in general, Death Wish is better off being built with just neither of those cards, and just trying to one for one all your consumes exactly. And like cheap value with Unseen Elder and potentially Marilorn. But I don't know, I, I never found the Deathwish deck that I thought was particularly good after the Froth nerf. So I could just be totally wrong. Maybe there's a list out there. Maruna, Deathwish, sees an enemy with three or less power. We got some people with this. <laughs> we got some people with this. I wasn't playing it for the longest time because I didn't like that it was random. But a lot of the time, your opponent's going to lead on, like, the Nilfgaard guy that gets a point every time they play a Deploy. Or if there's some weird NR deck, it'll be that NR unit that gets a point every time you play an Order. Or something like that. Or something that you can damage and then get into Maruna range. <laughs> and then you just steal it. And they're so sad. What were the best? Oh, the best Marunas were against, like, Big Woodland. <laughs> They'd go, like, play an Arcuspore. You'd wait a couple turns, steal the Arcuspore, and then have another Thrive unit lining up at three as well, and then you would kill the Maruna and steal that too. And you could just break up the entire Thrive package with Maruna Unseen Elder. Did I do enough card yet? I didn't. No, this is the first faction we're doing. We did neutral cards last night. That should be up on YouTube soon if you missed it. I think it's still processing. And we're doing monsters and... Let's see, what's the faction after monsters? And Nilfgaard. Monsters and Nilfgaard tonight. And if we have time, we'll do an R as well. Getting triple gills in the mirror with succubus. It's your favorite moment of BTR. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I don't know. This card's really funny. The problem with it is that it's just uh, a four for nine. When you play it and get max value, like it's fine. It's not like as exciting as getting like a crazy Imperial Manticore when your opponent just like leads on an Azrael on their old spear tip and you just play like a 20 point Manticore with hero power. You don't get those like super exciting Cyclopses later where your opponent tries to play around the Manticore's death wish. You chuck the Manticore at their smaller unit and steal their other big unit. You don't get that crazy stuff going with Maruna. But it does like just enough that it's probably still playable. I could see it losing another provision. I don't know. They get okay, so that's like the thing with the gold death wishes, right? Like you're often playing Marilorn and you can't Marilorn golds. So you only want so many gold death wishes in your deck. Because the only time that you're getting like good value on the gold death wishes is with your Unseen Elder. So you kinda have to pick which things you want to use Unseen Elder on. And if you're already playing Imperial Manticore or Werecat, it can be a little bit tough to justify playing yet another Gold Deathwish. Just because your deck only really synergizes with the Bronze ones. Toad Prince. Deploy melee. Consume a unit with three or less power. You're hoping to get nine for nine? <laughs> I don't know, this card would be a lot cooler if 
Actually, I, I don't even know. It's just so situational. There's no reason to consume things. There's no, like, Necker anymore that rewards you for consuming. There's no Arrakis Nest that gives you points every time you consume something. Like, this consume could basically just be replaced with whatever consume does, and there's no secondary benefit. There's no trigger that happens when you consume something. So really, this just says destroy an enemy unit, boost self by its power. As long as it's three or less power. If there were things that triggered off consumes, this card would be a lot more interesting. As it is now... I think, just like how situational it is, you'd rather just play Unicorn Kyrenix in almost every situation. Which is sad to say, because I really don't think Unicorn Kyrenix is all that good. It's just the other options around it aren't very good either in most factions. If the consume tag meant anything, it'd be cool. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, once we get to Scoyatel, we we'll start seeing how the elf tag matters a ton. And it makes cards that look otherwise unplayable suddenly playable. Boot all your Neckers. To be fair, if you're playing a 6-point unit, it probably does boost all your Neckers. Striga. Wait, what? This is a card. If you control the highest unit, damage the enemy by 5. Okay, so here's another uh, card you would never play over Unicorn or Kyrenix. Nice. Good faction card. 10 out of 10. Clusty Warp. Good old Glusty Warp. So obviously it's an Arrakis Queen card. You're never playing it outside of Arrakis Queen. This card's so fun, the Arrakis Queen. I was so sad when I had to cut it to find room for Royal Decree. <laughs> You're often playing this as like a at least 20 points. A bunch of the game is going to end up being about your opponent trying to kill off your ones to deny Glusty. And a lot of what you're trying to do with your Cyclops is to line up your opponent's units at once, so that you still get value out of Glusty even if you don't have enough ones. You'll do stuff like save Ruhin charges, use Slyzard, all this stuff to get as many ones into play in one turn in the same turn that you play the Glusty Warp as possible. So like even in control matchups, you're still usually getting like 10 for 9 on this. It's just there's no space. If you want to have a consistent consume deck, space is so ridiculously tight. Poor Glusty. What a cool card. If only there were like 10 more provisions. Or more mulligans. So I didn't have to play Decree and Daglefar. <laughs> Azrael, deploy melee, consume unit from your opponent's graveyard, deploy range, consume unit from your graveyard. So for a while, I thought this card was like 10 provisions. So I was playing Ghoul over this in a lot of decks. But Azrael is really just like a better Ghoul. I don't know why you'd ever play Ghoul over this. The ability to eat something out of your opponent's graveyard is a lot more utility than you'd think. It makes you better against stuff like Lemons. If you don't find a tall unit, uh, you're able to just like play this and eat like their Frenzy Dao or their Siri or something like that. It allows you to play this card with fewer targets in your deck. If you're trying to get away with like just a Goliath or like just an old Spear Tip, you can get away with that much easier with Azrael than you can with Ghoul. Don't play Ghoul. I mean, I, I realize that now, <laughs> obviously. I thought you were paying provisions, but you're really not. You're just getting an extra point. What I think of Azir playing Azrael with no tall units and control woodland, you can very easily get away with it. It's super easy to get away with. Actually, is it? Is the payoff there, I guess, is the next question. Because what? The best 
thing that you're trying to get in most matchups is going to be your opponent's Frenzied Dao. So you're getting 9 for 9. He wasn't playing Goyat? They don't play Dao Yiwen anyway. I mean, sort of? You still have to be able to kill the Dao and get it in their graveyard, right? Like, if they just save Dao for round 3. I guess you're always going to be able to kill it. It is kind of what your deck does. You can eat Ceres and Phoenix in your opponent's graveyard with some other uncommon targets in the opponent's graveyard. I mean, you can eat, like, their Roach. Against Nilfgaard. That's not really good. <laughs> that gets you 10, effectively. We have matchups you want more favor, like Big Woodland. Yeah, yeah. If you're worried about Big Woodland, then it's totally reasonable for sure. It's probably one of the better tech cards you can be playing. It just seems so free to play a Goliath. I guess is my main concern. I'd have to see the rest of the list. I don't know. Like, my concern is less that playing Azrael with no big targets is bad. And more that it's just so easy to fit in a Goliath. That you should probably just do that anyway if you're playing Azrael. Goliath and Scorch. Does it really conflict that much? You get to choose how you sequence your cards. Anyway, we're okay. Imlorit's Wrath, damage an enemy by the power of your highest ally. Provisions on it would be hard. Yeah, maybe. I really don't know the Woodland Control deck at all. I never really played it. People put this in Tall Woodland. I guess it was just for the mirror. It's such an expensive removal spell everywhere else. I guess against Morphrain it kills everything. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Cards like this always like look bad. But sometimes you get good rate, right? Like, if you have an old spear tip in play, and your opponent has an old spear tip in play, and the stars align in your favor, you get 13 for 8, and that's pretty exciting. But what, outside of that matchup in particular, the best you're probably going to get is your opponent plays a Mangonel, Morvran's it, and you shoot it with Wrath. Or I guess they play a Siri Dash, Morvran it, and you get a Wrath. It gives you some tall removal in that deck, which you otherwise don't have. So it solves a problem. You can't really play Garrett Professional. It's great to Parasite is better. Well, the problem with Parasite is Parasite doesn't kill a boosted Siri. Where this does. It it really depends what you're worried about, I think. Like, in the mirror, this is definitely better, right? Because neither of you are really interacting with each other. This is just going to get you 13 points or 15 points or whatever. And everywhere else, it just depends how much you value being able to kill something tall. But yeah, there is consistency issues. Like, in round 3, you can be stuck with this if the round is too short. And, like, you wasted your woodland early.
I think most of the time this was played against me, it was like a four. <laughs> but it's probably just due to what decks I was playing. I don't know. Wild Hunt cards are all about having the biggest, but they're not big Wild Hunt cards. Yeah, they're just meant to be played with their stuff. Whispering Hillock. Destroy an allied unit, spawn, and play a base copy. So in PTR, people played this with Phoenix. And that was kind of cool. Every card are boring. That's not true at all. There's a bunch of interesting stuff. Spawn and play a base copy. So, at a glance, this has some synergy with Death Wish. But not really. Like what, you're going to kill a Harpy Egg, get 8 points out of it? You're just getting an 8 for 8? That's you, you don't play a card like this just to kill a Harpy Egg. You can kill, what, Succubus? You're getting 6 maybe? But even then that requires some setup. Realistically, the only thing you're getting great value on with Hillock is something either like Corinthier or Ruhin. One thing this does is it does give you a way to unlock your Ruhin after it gets locked. Your opponent plays a lock, you Whispering Hillock play another copy of it. So it sort of doubles as either a card that pushes your ceiling a little bit higher by giving you multiple Ruhins to consume. Which really only matters if you're able to stick a Slyzard. Or it gives you an unlock for your Ruhin in those decks. I look for deploys. Yeah, I guess you could do it with like Zoltan. There's no really other deploys you'd want to spend that much to replay, right? Slizard charge one. No, Slizard is every single turn you get to consume a unit on the same row. It's cooldown one. Your organic tutor sometimes. There's not even that many organics you want to play. Like we did the search a second ago. Like what, once you play Ritzak, Hillock? There's what, A Rush in neutral. And then like, I don't want to... I don't even want to put the rest of these in my deck. It's for Quad Phoenix meme? Yeah, maybe. It was a lot easier to justify in PTR. It was a lot of fun in PTR. The problem is that that's a lot of... A lot of golds that you have to play in round one, and have to find in round one in particular, in order to get value out of them. Epidemic Venom. How do you... I mean, you're tutoring for Epidemic by playing a 2. Does the Epidemic not see the Wispus? Or are you just trying to kill 1s and 2s? Epidemic all your drones for Fran Valley. <laughs> it's like Forktail, but worse. The Crones! These cards are cool. These ended up... So when I first saw these in the Aridin list, I was a little surprised. I assumed that any deck that wanted to play Crones wanted to get good value on Bruis. Because that sort of like justifies putting a card like this in your deck to increase the value on these. But it sort of ends up just like in this metagame, consolidating points ends up being good enough that you can just slam Bruis. And it's fine. 
Twins have been pretty good when Andrew Brewers in the hand every game. Yeah, that too, right? Like, you can just, like, lead on lead on Brewers or play it in a round where you don't necessarily need as many points. And you're developing carryover for your Revis and Wispus. But yeah, Crones were some of my favorite cards going into Homecoming. I just never really found a deck that made them work. Because it felt like I either, either wanted to be playing a bunch of thinning, in which case I didn't have the provisions to justify playing these anymore. Or I wanted to have this consume be worth something. And then the next where I wanted this consume to be worth something, I also didn't have provisions. But it just worked perfectly in the the Aridin deck. Both this boost and damage effect are really valuable in making your Aridin the tallest unit. Or making your uh, Sabbath the tallest unit. And the Consume kind of did the same thing. Aside from the obvious benefit of like consolidating points away from a Wolfsbane or Wild Boar. Yeah, these cards are sweet. Corinthier. Spawn a one power copy of a unit in your hand, summon it to this row. I'm trying to think if I used it for any reason other than to spawn extra Ruhains or Karens. I'm pretty sure the only deck that I tried this in, after I made sure that I couldn't still do Phoenix shenanigans with Phoenix costing a million provisions, was in Consume. Sometimes you spawn an Ancient Fog and you have no other targets. I think spawning Alpha War with this is damn great. I mean, it's okay. It depends how much you can thrive it. It's sort of like playing an alpha werewolf. It ate provisions, right? If thriving it up to... Four is free. You're getting three additional points, which kind of makes up for the extra provisions you're paying. I mean, it's not bad. I wouldn't say it's damn great. You'll play it with Siri. Oh, I did see people play it doing this with like Siri Dash. Yeah. Six and Thrive Immune. Oh, does the the Thrive immediately trigger? I tried it in Aaron with Dash. No, it was a backup and ended up cutting it. This card in Helix synergized really well. Yeah, it's one of the few deploys you might want to reuse with Helix. It's just a powerful deployability. When I was playing Helix Corinthian and Consume, Obviously the most common target was just to Hillic a Ruhin. But after that it was probably to Hillic Corinthia to make another Karan. Yeah, this card's really cool. I'm glad it exists. <laughs> Rockus Behemoth, spawn two Rockus drones, summon them to a row, boost all other insectoids on this row by one. When you have four drones on a row, you play this, then you have six drones on a row, and you're getting 10 points. Because you're making four, four plus four plus two. So when you have two other drones on a row, you're getting 4 plus 2 plus 2 and breaking even. I 
Every time that I wanted to put this in a deck, I just decided that it was a worse Glusty Warp. <laughs> and I never had space to play both, so I never really put this in a deck. I don't know, that's cool. It does something... I don't want to say it does something unique, because it kind of does the same thing Glusty does. It's kind of cool. You really like Monsters are her favorite faction? There's a lot of cool stuff going on in Monsters, I agree. It seems like Monsters has the most interesting cards. I don't mean the cost is probably fair. It's just if you're playing this, you're playing Rockus Queen, and if you're playing Rockus Queen, you have more efficient things to be doing in your top end. Building around the Rockus Drones isn't really doable when everyone's playing Forktails or Malanes or Archers or Mangonels. Yeah, 7 for 8. There's even less to say about this one than the last Vanilla. Cool. We sort of covered this when we were talking about Azrael. Uh, it's basically just a worse Azrael. You play it if you need more copies of Azrael. Losing the ability to interact with your opponent's graveyard is very significant. It's at the core of the Tall Woodland deck. Not really much else to say. As good as this card is. Monsters and Nilfgaard are your favorite so far. You know, Reveal is not like this, but Nilfgaard has a lot of potential to feel more like old Nilfgaard and Reveal is nerfed and changed and other things like tactics are buffed. Uh, I don't know, maybe. We'll have to see. Anyway, damage enemy by 6 or boost an ally by 6. It's better than Alzer's Thunder. <laughs> it's an organic that matters a little bit. I saw this see a little bit of play. It's really not that bad. 6 kills Siri, it kills Siri Dash, it kills Avalok. It kills a lot of some of the bigger things that you don't expect to just die to removal instantly. And you're not paying that much of a premium for the effect. If you're worried about points, you always have the points from boost, even if you don't have a target for the damage. And really paying one point for that. Or one one extra provision for the point. Isn't that punishing? The problem is that monsters decks tend to be pretty high synergy. So you don't really have space for something like this in most cases. Like, this isn't a thing that you can ghoul. It isn't triggering your thrives. It's not doing anything like that. It's not a death wish unit. It's not a death wish enabling unit. It doesn't consume anything. Parasite card have any combos? No, it's just a removal card. Just a versatile removal card. Imperial Manticore. Parasite is so trash. I don't agree with you at all. <laughs> I don't agree with you at all. Destroy the lowest enemy. This card's sweet. This was the most fun card in the Deathwish deck. There's like a whole uh, compilation clip that I posted to YouTube a week or two ago. It's just a bunch of really sick manticores people walked into. Sometimes your opponent just doesn't think about it. They're trying to play around your Azrael, and they'll lead on their own ghoul. And you just blow them up for like 14 points. And later on, they'll stop respecting the Manticore, and they'll get some crazy Cyclops as well. This, I don't think any card has led to as many just like silly blowout games that I played as much as Manticore. People have so little respect.
Abaya, Thrive, Trigger a Bronze, Allies, Deathwish. <laughs> I don't know. I was on and off Marilorn when I was playing Deathwish. I was so scared with all the control going around. People were just gonna. People were just killing my Deathwish units before I could play Marilorns. In general, thriving this above 5 in a Deathwish deck is going to be pretty tricky. So you're not really getting good rate. You're paying 2 extra points on this over you would on a Marilorn, except you have to thrive it twice to get it to that value. Ugh. Yeah, I don't know. I I was cutting Marilorns. I couldn't imagine playing this if I was cutting Marilorns. The archetype is just kind of mismatched. The only thing that gets super tall in Consume is like maybe Seleno Harpy. As you're consuming. Yeah. Marilorn's bad, expensive Marilorn's even worse. Yeah, it's pretty much. I don't want to say Marilorn is bad, because Marilorn is one of the few good ways to like reuse Death Wishes. Like the Harpy Egg into Unseen Elder into Marilorn, into like Selena Harpy, just such a good swing. It's just enough people just kill your Harpy Eggs. Because they're respecting Marilorns, that Marilorn becomes worse. Werecat. Thrive, deploy, damage all units on the opposite row by one. Repeat the deploy ability. I really like Werecat. I really like Werecat. Uh, it's only good if your opponent's... If you're like worried about your opponent row stacking. But like especially when Germain was everywhere, because a lot of people were playing Froth. Werecat was just such a good answer. You didn't mind playing it too early. Because you're getting value on the Thrives. Like, you'll Thrive this up to, like, 5 after answering the tokens or whatever. And it's not hard to trigger this Death Wish three times. If you know it's going to be a matchup where you're going to get value out of this, you can just save your Unseen Elder. You can play Werecat, use Unseen Elder, and then next turn, like, chuck this with Cyclops or eat it with Selena Harpy. Or Thrive it a bunch of times, and then eventually trigger the Death Wish. I really liked Werecat back when everyone was row stacking. The problem is... Dex kind of stopped row stacking. <laughs> and like after the hotfix, it was kind of tough to find like super crazy rows to play Werecat onto. Also, because the Deathwish deck tends to want to split rounds up, unless you draw this in round one, it really wasn't that good anymore. Like you generally want to play this in round one in order to secure the round. But in rounds 2 and 3, you're trying to play each round like 4 or 5 cards deep. And in 4 or 5 card deep rounds, Werecat's just not valuable at all. So, I don't know. The card has some problems. But certainly in certain metagames, this card is just huge. It's an okay Hillock target. Yeah, it's really not the bad of a Hillock target. Turns Hillock into a Lacerate. Could be worse. Miss the unique archetype in each faction. I don't know if you... What? <laughs> I don't even know how to address these people. Griffin. Destroy an allergy on this row if there are no units to destroy self. This kills Ancient Foglets, but it kills Ancient Foglets worse than Forktail. It triggers Death Wishes, but it triggers Death Wishes worse than Selena Harpy. It also comes down... 
as white strength instead of green strength, which makes it worse against croc. Because it makes it easier for them to set up their wild boar. We played this in consume once we cut the slizards because we just needed another way to like get value out of Ruhin. But even there, it's like it was a worse Selena Harpy for one more provision. If you're eating a one, <laughs> you're getting eight for eight. I don't know. This this card's weird. It feels like it only makes sense in a Rockus Queen, but in a Rockus Queen, it's just like a more expensive other consume, which has less value. This one's just extra fuel for Ghoul. But it's not even good fuel for Ghoul. I mean, it's fine. It's not the worst. It's a point more than Frenzy Dao. But do you really need a Ghoul target that bad that you want to put Griffin in your deck? If Forktail didn't exist, you might run this for Foglet. Yeah, maybe. But even then, like, it's not that much better than just playing Seleno Harpy. It's two points for one provision. Like, instead of playing a six for six that triggers the Ancient Foglet, you're playing an eight for seven. And you're losing a lot of versatility. In all the situations where you don't have the Ancient Foglet to go with the Griffin. Because, like, consuming an Arcaspore after it's thrived a couple times is way better than griffoning an Arcaspore. Good in Yard and Yardinetta. That's true. That's true. When it being white strength instead of green strength matters, it's just the opposite is important right now. I'd much rather have green strength than white strength. Because of Wild Boar. It's really the only card that it matters for. Or, I guess, Bloodthirst cards in general. It's only one point more than Harpy. One provision more than Harpy. But two more points when it's eating an Ancient Foglet. Harpy is consumed, Griffin is destroy. Yeah. What does that matter? Devana Runestone. Nithral! <laughs> I don't know, it's just worse than Frenzy Dow. Just play fucking Frenzy Dow. The thing about Nithral is that you're gonna want to mulligan this in matchups that don't have artifacts. Which means a couple things. A, if your opponent's trying to do some tricky shit by tricking you with bit with like a bamboozly sihil. Or just like randomly having a bunch of artifacts saved to round three that you weren't expecting. Now you're gonna lose to them because you mulliganed your Nathral. But also it's another card that you're gonna want to mulligan because it's just so weak in matchups where it's not good. The cool part about Frenzy Dao is that it solves both of these things. It's just a high power card you just want to play regardless. Because it's a seven. Seven is just more than you're gonna get out of most cards. It triggers your Thrives better. It's better with Ghoul, it's better with Azrael. And nobody can trick you into mulliganing Frenzy Dao. If they're playing Sahil and you're playing Frenzy Dao, you just get them. Play Nathral and Dao. Yeah, if you want to play two artifact removal, you're definitely going to be playing Nathral before you play Bomb Thrower. But I'm never like excited to put Nathral in my deck, even though there's this upside to it. Are you looking forward to patch? Yeah, of course. Looking forward to patch notes, too. Good morning, Yangtze. What's up?
Skeleton. Boots self by two for every unit more your opponent has on the battlefield. It looks like they they tried to make an archetype based on this. And it just really wasn't there. Where are the patch notes? We don't have patch notes yet. That's why I'm looking forward to patch notes. Yeah, I don't know. This card's... I mean, it's a 6 provision gold. So it's like basically a bronze, but you can only play one of it. There's no way to like give your opponent units. At least no reasonable way to give your opponent units. You could like trigger the death wish when you're a goal a bunch. <laughs> I don't know. It feels like they were trying to do something. But the idea just didn't come through all the way. Villum. I guess you could Villum. It gives them one extra unit. Maybe it's a consume card. I mean, yeah, you could try to keep your own board really small and just hope your opponent plays units. But... Ugh. It just doesn't seem like you're getting enough value if you do that. Like what, you're always going to have like 2 or 3 units in play, even if the round goes 10 cards long. If your opponent's not playing anything that spawns multiple units, they'll have what, like 9 or 10 in play when you play this, versus your 3? And you're kind of getting value. That's a lot of work. Meh. Hideous Feast. Damage enemy by 3, boost an ally by 3. So this goes really well with all the cards that try to make you have the tallest unit. Unfortunately, it's a special card that doesn't like create proactive points, which kind of makes it difficult to justify. I don't know, it's just a 6 for 6. It's an organic, whatever that matters. Playing consume without consume leader. I mean, death wish, whatever. First round before play witchers. Uh, yeah, yeah. The thing is, like, if you're trying to exploit this, like, exploit your opponent having more units than you, Forktail just does it so much better. Because with Forktail, your Thrives just don't count as units. So you sort of double dip there. You're triggering your Ancient Foglets, which gets you points there. It's just so much easier to get good value on Forktail than it is to get value on Yoten. By default, your Forktail is worth 5. By default, this is worth 1. This is Bronze Parasite. Uh, I mean, it's pretty different than Parasite. Parasite kills things. This doesn't really kill things. It kills some really small engines where Parasite answers stuff like Siri, Siri Dash, Avalok. The more difficult to kill big units people expect to live. Selena Harpy, deploy, consume an allied unit. This is pretty much the same idea as Cyclops. Cyclops provides removal, this provides more just like points in play. Cyclops is a control card, Selena Harpy removes units for Wolfsbane, removes units for uh Wild War of the Sea while consolidating points down. License to draw, tier one sub. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. The hierarchy generally, I play Cyclops before I play Selena Harpy, but in most decks, I end up playing both. Because <laughs> if you're in the market for this kind of effect, you're generally in the market for a lot of this kind of effect, and there just aren't that many ways to get it. You have Selena Harpy, you have Cyclops, 
Then you have Barbagazi, if you don't mind forcing, like, requiring something to live. And then you have Kran, which is really expensive. And you have Slyzard, which dies a lot. Those are really the only ways to get value out of eating your own stuff. Oh yeah, Barbagazi. He's also right here. Same idea. You get more consumes than Selena Harpy does, but you trade vulnerability for that. Your opponent can just kill this before you get to consume anything, and then you don't get anything. On average, being that he's 5, the only thing that's really killing him in one turn is Eithne. For the most part. Like, there's some weird stuff Croc can do, where they have, like, Savage Bear and Hero Power, or Savage Bear and a Mastercrafted Spear. They can kill it. But generally, 5 is fairly safe from non Eithne. Do I not use autocomplete on emote names? I, I don't know what autocomplete is. Is there autocomplete for Twitch chat? <laughs> I'll do other factions. Yeah, uh, Monsters is the first faction. We did Neutrals last night, that'll be up on YouTube shortly. After Monsters, we're going to do Nilfgaard, and then whatever is after Nilfgaard. Northern Realms. Yeah. Uh... In general, I like this better than Seleno Harpy. If the meta isn't as controlly. Use a colon? Wait. Oh my god, that's so cool! <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I feel like such a fool. Sidecraft, by the way. <laughs> there is no class on how to use Twitch chat. Wild Hunt Rider. If you control the highest unit, summon a copy of Wild Hunt Rider from your deck to this row. This card's really efficient. <laughs> like, super efficient. Like, more efficient than Witcher's efficient. The problem is, you don't find it round one, and if you don't find it in round one, the efficiency doesn't matter as much, because you're not getting value out of the thinning. It demands a mulligan, so if you're playing them in addition to witchers, things get a little bit awkward with your mulligans. And also, even if you have this in round one, you can't always guarantee having the highest unit. And a lot of opponents know to try to keep the highest unit to deny you from being able to play riders in round one. Like, especially if you lose coin flip and your opponent just, like, leads on dude tack advantage. It's like a really... It's like a cheap witcher, the only downside is you mull them a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the only leaders that can really justify playing Witchers, Roach, and Rider are the three mulligan leaders, which aren't really the same leaders that want to be playing Witchers, Roach, and Rider to thin towards combo cards. Counts itself when considering the highest units huge. Yeah, for some reason, Wild Hunt Rider counts itself, but Wild Hunt Hound does not. <laughs> I don't know why those conditions are coded differently, but they are. Using loose coin flips being on red coin. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Look, I come from other card games. In other card games, when we're going second, we lost coin flip.
Alpha Werewolf Immune Thrive. This card is sick. It's so sick. The immune is so good. Especially since you want to lead the round on a card like this. This card's existence is one of the main reasons why I stopped playing Blue, Blue, Blue Mountain Elites. The Scoia'tael 4 that deals 4 as long as the thing is the only unit on the row. It's the only 5 provision gold in the game. Yeah, that sounds right. This card's so good. It's the perfect numbers for Forktail, too. It comes down as 5. So until you thrive it, it's the perfect number for Forktail. You'd still play this for 6? Uh, probably? I don't think it's a problem that it's 5. It's just a cool card. Like, thriving things from 5 isn't super easy. Like, depending on... Like, you kind of have to build around thrives to get bigger than, like, 6. Because there's just not that many cards that are naturally that big. Immune is worth 1 or 2 points. I... It's really weird to put a value on immune. Because sometimes immune just doesn't matter. Like, obviously immune matters more on engines than it does on other things. That's why immune on this is so threatening, but immune on regular werewolf doesn't really matter unless your opponent's deck has way too much removal. But that's the thing, though. I think, I think cheap cards that are really efficient and on provisions are good for the game overall, just because it makes the game less about being forced to mulligan all your low provision cards and hoping that you can draw into your gold cards, and more about building your deck to maximize value between the synergies of your cheap cards. So I really like stuff like Alpha Werewolf being good, and stuff like Forktail being good, and stuff like Arcaspore being really good on a per provision basis. Just because it makes the game feel less draw-based and a lot more interesting. Do I have a card that I hate the most in the Monsters faction? Uh, probably Aridin. Predatory dive. Each player destroys their lowest unit. Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's a card. The more you respect it, the worse it is. <laughs> I don't really know what there is to say about this. It's obviously good in the control deck. Because you can simplify the game to the point where they only have good units in their hand, and then you get to dive a good unit out of them. But, I don't know. <laughs> it's a card. All these cards being good are limited design for monsters golds. You can't put good monsters golds with high provision because their low provisions are so good. Or you could just give good provision bronzes to every other faction. Like, Nilfgaard and Monsters both have very good bronzes. Even Scoia'tael has very good bronzes, just in a sort of different way. Just catch Monsters up. Catch... Or, catch Northern Realms up. Catch, uh... Let's catch Skellige up. Even with Skellige, though, it doesn't matter as much, because their faction is so based around, like, Burnabran and Heimeskald. Being able to cycle towards finding good golds. You get blue coin playing versus woodland, you always play- No, I fucking never play around predatory dives blind. 
Because, like, 95% of the woodlands you play against are just big monsters. This guy, like, has three good bronzes. Yeah, and one and a half of them you want to discard. <laughs> the half being Savage Bear. Uh, I think he was going with uh, Skirmisher, Savage Bear, and Pirate Captain. Uh, anyway, Rockus Nest. Back before the Froth nerf, people were trying to make Froth monsters work with us. I don't know. Pumpkin says Woodland Control, best deck in the game. Doesn't Pumpkin also think Scoia'tael is the worst faction in the game? Pirate Captain, yikes. I mean, I didn't say it was an exciting bronze. Just that it's a good bronze. As long as you build around it, you're getting good raid on it. It's a 6 for 4. Uh, but yeah, this card's so boring that we're talking about other things. I'm sorry. <laughs> Forkdale! What a card. Okay, so, strictly speaking, this card is bonkers. This card is so broken. <laughs> this card is so insane, but I love that it's in the game, and I would not change it. I think it leads to great gameplay. I think the sub game of like, when do I play my Witchers? When do I want to commit multiple units to the board in one play to minimize my opponent's Forktail value? When do I try to bait my opponent's Forktails out? Uh, should I kill my opponent's Ancient Foglets? I think this card leads to so many interesting decisions. That I would love to just not see this card changed. <laughs> you could maybe add like a provision or two to it, and it would still be playable. But, man. I would love it if there were just more interesting cards in the game like Forktail. It looks so unassuming, right? It's just like a symmetrical damage all other units by one effect. But there are so many things in the Monsters faction that make it not symmetrical. Whether it be Thrive, whether it be Ancient Foglet, whether it be Consumes, whether it be Vran Warrior. There's so many ways to take advantage of the symmetrical ability. This card will still be good because of Ancient Foglet existence. Uh, I mean, probably. You could argue that this is undercosted by, like, three provisions. But would the game really be better if Forktail cost three more provisions? I, I don't think so. I think it's fine. Like, Monsters isn't even that crazy right now. Best bronze in the game. You could definitely make an argument for it. I'm not totally sure I agree, but you could definitely make an argument for it. There's like an argument for Forktail, there's an argument for Arcaspore. I could see an argument for Skirmisher. This is not significantly overperforming cards are unhealthy. I completely disagree. I, I just, like, fundamentally disagree with that statement. Overpowered stuff, as long as it leads to fun and interactive games, is totally fine. Dwarven... I did not... No, not Dwarven Skirm. You, you know what I mean. The, the discard-y one. The, uh, the Heimei Skirmisher, whatever the fuck it's called. Find the stays at five for the key bronze. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I would much prefer to see other bronzes on a similar power level. I don't think it's as important for SK. It almost can't underperform though. Oh, I've discarded a lot of Forktails. You haven't played with Forktail enough if you've never discarded Forktail.
not knowing the Skellige clans. <laughs> yeah, I, I love me some Fork Tales. Rot Fiend. Damage a random enemy by four. So there's really only four playable Deathwish cards, or at least bronzes. You got Rot Fiend, you got Bridge Chill, you got Harpy Egg. And they kind of all make the, the core of the Deathwish deck. Rot Fiend is the most inconsistent value, but it allows you to kill engines early. If your opponent does something like lead on Mangonel and not buff it, you can go Rot Fiend Hero Power guarantee a kill on it. The problem is later, once your opponent has a mix of units in play and some of them are one or two power, you're not guaranteed to get four points out of Rot Fiend, where you are at a bridge troll. However, with... Fuck, they're not even next to each other? Oh, come on. <laughs> However, with Bridge Troll, because it boosts the highest ally by four, if you trigger this a bunch of times, you just have one really stupid-looking Scorch or Peter target. <laughs> uh... So you have consistent value that's very easy to interact with. Inconsistent value that gives you a point of interaction. And then you have Harpy Egg, which is just always five points. Although those five points line up for Shiru and Igni. Because despite what Harpy Egg says, Harpy Egg's token always goes on the same row as the egg. If the unit is immune, 20 and immune sounds good. Yeah, until you get a Yurdened or Scorched or Ignite or any of those things. The bigger a unit gets, the less relevant immune becomes. Like, once you have a really tall unit, aside from, like, Geralt Professional, the only thing that's really killing it is stuff that doesn't target anyway. Obviously, like, locks, too, but we're not really talking about that. We're talking about getting the points. Oh, yeah, Ice Troll. I almost skipped it. <laughs> if you control fewer units on the battlefield, boost self by one. This is, again, like, it just feels like an archetype that wasn't fleshed out. You can almost play this in Deathwish, except Harpy Eggs replace themselves, Ancient Foglets replace themselves, uh, Archospores kill your opponent's units, Rot Fiends kill your opponent's units. So you can't really play it in Deathwish either. It has to be fewer and not equal, so it doesn't even work if you're playing second and your opponent plays a unit. If I shall trigger it on tie, it'd be decent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The fact that it has to be fewer. Makes it a lot harder to find use. If you're able to consistently trigger this, it's sort of like a Magna Division, right? It comes down as a 5 for 5 because it triggers on turn end and it boosts by 1 every turn. That's pretty solid for an engine. It's just the engine's condition is a lot harder than Magna Division's condition. Worst bronze card in the game? Crow's Eye. Actually, that's probably not fair. Chris is a four. <laughs> a four that does nothing is probably better than some bronzes. Magnavision's condition is either don't play Roach or get super lucky with Roach. Yeah. Slyzar, consume an allied unit on this row. When this card lives, <laughs> man, when Slyzard lives, it is so gross. Especially with, like, Ruhines. In a Rockus Queen, this is just a point every turn at minimum, usually significantly more when you're eating Ruhin. The only issues is that A, it comes down as a 4, and there's no real way to make it bigger the same turn. And B, it gets really tall. 
Like, once you start consuming a Ruhin every turn, you end up consolidating a lot of points into this one thing. And it's not hard for your opponent to just, like, scorch it away or line up some kind of... big swingy thing. Wait, what? Is there any way to give Zeal a monster than Petri? No. You can give this immune with Avalok. That's kind of it. Yeah, why are we bullying Crozier? He's probably not even awake yet. If you're going to bully people, at least bully them in their time zone. I already talked about Bridge Troll. Foglet. So this is the other... The other Death Wish. <laughs> Somehow the condition on this is harder than Wild Hunt Rider. And you get less points out of it than Wild Hunt Rider. Oh, thanks, Sanguine Rose. Wait, why did the robot lady say Trinet? It's supposed to say Trinet. It was Trinet before. Did they fix it? Why would they fix that? <laughs> anyway, thanks, Sanguine Rose. Appreciate it. Hope you come back to Gwen eventually. Hope the December patch fixes some of the issues. If you're gonna bully someone, at least do that when they're awake. Yeah, what? I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to have. Let's see, quote, add, there we go. Quote number 17. Uh, but yeah, somehow the condition on this card is both more difficult and you get less points out of this. I guess it's a 5 instead of a 6. It kind of makes it reasonable. It's just you would never play this before Wild Hunt Rider unless you were super tight on provisions. Because triggering a Death Wish sort of costs a point in a way. Because you're paying a point on Cyclops, you're paying a point on Seleno Harpy. It's just so... Uh, so not good. It's really more than one, too. Because you wouldn't play a 6 for 6. Especially not in Monsters. Even in Deathwish, when I wanted another thinning card, I played Riders before Foglet. Wyvern, he's a beast! He damages an enemy by two. He's a wolf pack for one more provision and one more point. Wild Hunt Warrior. <laughs> Damage a unit by one for each Wild Hunt unit on this row. Reach one. I think only mods can add quotes. I don't know, there's not enough Wild Hunt units. Well, A, there's not enough Wild Hunt units, and B, this has reach one. C, we're in monsters, and monsters bronzes are ridiculous, so why would you play this? There we go. The condition on Foglet was easier, it would be really good. Yeah, yeah. A 5 provision thinning card? It's great. C, you need to play all Wild Hunt units on melee? Yeah. If Foglet had the same text as Rider, it would be better. Oh, for sure. 100%. A 3 for 3 that thins, or a 3 for 5 that thins is much better than a 4 for 6 that thins. Because you're not diluting your deck as much. The thinning has more value.
All attacking units should have base reach 2. Add a card with a reach reducing mechanic. I don't hate that. I really don't hate that. Several cards good with reach 1. That's why he said by default, though. Or base. Oh. I, I, I guess I meant... Uh, it depends what he means. Like, you could still have Alba Spearman have reach one. But just, like, not have Kyrenix having reach three. Uh, Harpy Egg, we kind of talked about Harpy Egg already. We talked about the other Deathfish units. It's the highest value bronze death wish you can trigger. You're getting five instead of four. The only issue is that while it says to random allied row, it actually spawns at the same row as the harpy egg. So you end up playing into Igni quite frequently. Uh, Sheer ends up being better against you than you would hope for your deck full of units that get value when they die. Only fault to spread stuff that honor. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still pretty tilted with the whole Gimpy Gerwin being melee locked with Reach 2. I made that mistake way too many times. Wild Hunt Hound. Damage enemy by 1. If you control the highest unit, damage by 3 instead. So it's a 5 provision card that when things go well, you're getting 6 value on, and 6 of it, it, and, it and it's in damage, right? Uh, I don't know. I think some people like this card. I was never big a big fan. It seemed like way too often I had to play this as a four. It sort of has the same problem as Wild Hunt Rider. It's also just not great value when you consider all the things you can do in monsters with your bronzes. If this is working as Rider, it would be a good card. Uh, I mean, it would be better. I still don't think I would want to play it. There's just so many better things you can be doing in Monsters instead of playing Wild on Hound. What strength do you think a taunt unit would need to stay balanced? Depends on the provision cost. Wild Hunt Hound is the card you play in round two after a long round one when your opponent try passes against you. <laughs> I don't want to play a five provision card like that though. That's what fours are for. Marilorn, trigger a bronze allies death wish ability. So with Harpy Egg, you're getting 8 for 5, kind of. It's a little more complicated than that because you have to kind of average the points together with the Harpy Egg and the consumer that you're going to use later. And it's more about like the total points of the system. But let's just say you're getting 8 for 5 because you're getting this in addition to the consume. And that looks really good on paper. 8 for 5 is pretty solid. The only issue is that against a lot of control decks... People respect Marilorn more than they probably should and end up killing a lot of your Deathwish units, especially when you bleed them into a short round. When you get stuck with like one or two Deathwish units against Eifne and you have a Marilorn in your hand, your opponent's often just going to kill both of them and you play a three-point card. Marilorn, so even Deathwish doesn't like Crow. I mean, you wouldn't play Crow's Eye if Marilorn didn't exist either. Like, what's the ceiling on Crow's Eye, right? You're playing a Harpy Egg, hoping that it lives a turn, and then you get 5 for 4 on your Crow's Eye. Even this card's barely worth playing because of the risk. You wouldn't, you wouldn't play Crow's Eye. Uh, Crow's Eye only targets bronzes, yes. Siren, deploy, boost to Deathwish ally by 3. This has 
no synergy at all with anything Deathwish is trying to do. <laughs> it's really just purely a points card. It has the same exact problem Marilorn does. End of the ceiling is lower. Drowner, thrive. Damage enemy by two, move it to the other row. This is like a much, much, much better Strays of Spala. What's my Cyclops to target? That, that's true, that's true. It sometimes helps for Cyclops to target. Sometimes you're going to end up wasting some points. But it does help a little bit. On average, probably. Full update notes get posted? No, we're getting those on Monday. This is just a retrospective review. Now that we've gotten to play with the cards a bit, we're talking about them based on what we've seen over the last month. Uh, I wouldn't say that this is one of the best Thrive units, but it is worth mentioning the cheaper, or the lower power a Thrive unit is, the better, because it's easier to trigger the smaller Thrives than the bigger Thrives. Like, Thriving from 2 to 3 is much easier than Thriving from 5 to 6. The downside is that it's also much easier to kill smaller Thrives, and unlike Arcaspore, this doesn't have that built-in protection. When this dies, you just get your 4 for 5. Where when Arcaspore dies, you're getting 5 for 4. I would put this, like, slightly above Necker Warrior, but well below Arcaspore in terms of, like, the, the hierarchy of good Thrive units. The movement's not irrelevant, right? Against, like, Nilfgaard, being able to move Magna Divisions off of a row. Against a lot of, like, weird Northern Realms decks, you can deny their engines. Against... Let's see. I mean, it allows you to tech stuff like Ragnarug and maybe Dragon's Dream. A bunch of little things that you can do with the movement effect that are a little bit tricky. Long ships, yep. Necker Warrior. Thrive. This guy's pretty unassuming. A 4 for 4 with Thrive. Thriving from 5 to 4, or from 4 to 5, isn't super easy. But these numbers end up working out really well with Forktail. Like, you can Thrive this once and then still play a Forktail, and this doesn't count towards the number of units you have in play for Forktail. Isn't Drowner better than Necker Warrior? It's, it's what I said, yeah. The hierarchy is like Arcaspore, Alpha Werewolf, Drowner, Necker Warrior. I don't think I'm missing anything. Though obviously it's going to depend like how many provisions you have access to. Sometimes you just need to fill up another four. Werecat. Werecat's not really a Thrive unit. You don't put Werecat in your deck to Thrive with it. It's just like a little upside that you have. Yeah, no, this guy, he just works. You're generally getting good value on this. It's usually like a... When it doesn't die, you're usually getting like 6 or 7 points out of it. Obviously, when it dies, you're just getting four, but eh. You want to play Werecat turn four or five? Honestly, the best Werecats are like the very end of the round. You go like Werecat, Unseen Elder, then the following turn, you eat it with like a Seleno Harpy. And just use it as like a pseudo Dragon's Dream. Yeah, card just works. It's efficient. Thrive is a powerful keyword. Even if you can't thrive this too high, even if you're only expecting to get it to like 6 in your deck, you're still getting a 6 for 4. And sure, sometimes it dies and you're only getting 4 for 4, but... Eh. It's not really that much worse than when an Arcus board just dies. Werewolf. Immune. Yeah, this is a... This is a card. Is there really anything to say about it? It's just a... 
It's a card that annoys your opponent when they're playing a high removal deck. There's not really much more to it. It's not like it's an engine, right? The immune... It's not a must-answer threat. It's just when your opponent has a hand that is full of effects that require like a target on the opponent's side of the board to get value. You deny them a target for an additional turn when you play Werewolf. It's Big Woodland's favorite 12. Uh, I mean, I guess. That doesn't really have other 12s. <laughs> eh. Fiend, boost all death missions in your hand by one. I really thought this card was going to be good. I significantly overvalued Carryover going into Homecoming. In PTR, I thought this card was the nuts. Granted, this card had an additional point on it in PTR. But I kind of just overvalued all of the hand buff effects going into Homecoming. It ends up being that round winning round one is so important. That having like a few Carryover points just isn't that big of a deal. And on blue coin, despite having the five free points, you still need to play a significant amount of tempo. You can't just like get away with playing in these three point cards. In Woodland, you better play the Alpha Werewolf. Yeah, you generally play both. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This is... Maybe just like when winning round one is less important, Fiend becomes better. But even then, you still have the problem of needing tempo to not just lose your card in round one. And the tempo on Fiend is just so bad. You also have to play a lot of Deathwish units for it to be good. And if you're playing too many Deathwish units, you don't have enough ways to trigger Deathwishes. There's no, like, Deathwish unit that doubles as a Cyclops or doubles as a Seleno Harpy. Every Deathwish unit in your hand is one more card that doesn't trigger Deathwish. And when you have an imbalanced number of Deathwishes to Deathwish triggers, you're losing a lot of points. Like, every Deathwish that you're not able to trigger is, like, losing four to five points. Only good on round two dry pass. Well, it's good round one on red coin. Why is it trying to bot now called Tribot? I think it was taken. The problem with Fiend is that he's really good in round one, but if you draw him round three, he sucks. Uh. Well, that combined with not having enough mulligans in Unseen Elder, that's less of an issue when you have enough mulligans. Can I add Pepega? I don't know, can I? Is that on Franker face? Is this just Pepe with the Santa hat? Wait, there's two of them. Which one should I be adding? <laughs> I'm guessing the one with more users? Wait, there's a lot of these. One with the capital P. There's a few with the capital P. Link me which one. Uh, Vran Warrior. Whenever units destroy during your turn, damage any by one. <laughs> okay, so on one hand, this guy always dies, but he's a four. So it's not too big of a deal that he always dies. They use like three or four damage to kill your four. It, it's whatever. You're, you're trading fairly fairly fine. It's not like you're playing this 10 provision order unit for five points that has to live or you don't get value out of it. When it dies, it's not the end of the world. When this guy lives in consume, holy shit, you're getting like 20 plus points on your forktails. 
you'll have like five tokens in play. You'll play a fork tail. You'll damage their board by one. You'll kill five of your tokens, and then you start killing their stuff with the ran pings. And as the ran kill stuff, he pings more stuff. <laughs> when ran lives, he is the most disgusting dude. By Adu, okay. Uh, should be there soon. Unfortunately, you can only play this in consume, right? Like, I, I you can't really play this in the other Forktail decks because a you need to have a lot of one point units in play, and the only way to really get a lot of one point units in play is with Arrakis Queen. Like, just killing your Ancient Foglet isn't proccing Ran enough times. But man, in Arrakis Queen, when they don't kill this, <laughs> it gets nasty. It gets nasty. Wild Hunt Navigator. I feel like people that play this card are just coming from other factions, and they think, "Oh, hey, this is a this is a pretty reasonable five for four. In any other faction, that'd be great." Unfortunately, it's competing with stuff like Necker Warrior, which is almost like as long as it lives for a turn, you're getting five. It's competing with stuff like Ancient Foglet, which is basically a a five or a six for four. It's competing with Arcaspor, which even when it dies immediately, you're getting 5 for 4. And when it lives, you're probably getting something like 7 or 8. In any other faction, this card would be a lot more interesting. It's just in the faction that has the best bronzes, so there's no reason to play a card like this. Cockatrice, damage it anyway too for each adjacent beast. Somehow they made a faction card that on average is probably worse than Wolfpack. It also has reach one for some reason. I'm not really sure what's going on with this. It's a beast, I guess. Ancient Foglet, it's another card that Forktail skips over as long as your opponent doesn't kill it. You can play this, your opponent plays a unit that's plus one point on your Forktail, since your Forktail will enable your your dude. Uh, so, what I was saying earlier about like when you build your deck around Forktail, it becomes good. What I mean is like going into a round, you can go like Ancient Foglet into Necker Warrior, into Drowner, into uh, Alpha Werewolf, and then like five or six cards into the round, you still haven't played a single card. Their Forktail actually damages. And your opponent the whole time has been playing units. So when you finally play this Forktail, nothing on your board really takes damage because you're either thriving or your your Ancient Foglet's procking. And everything on your opponent's side of the board takes one. Yeah, outside of Ancient Voglet, or uh, outside of like Forktail and I guess like Consume stuff, it's not great. In PTR, you could do some cool stuff in Deathwish decks. It used to be if you used Marilorn or Unseen Elder on Ancient Voglet, it would boost by 4 and gain Doomed, even though it didn't go to the graveyard. However, after PTR, it no longer does that, and if you use Unseen Elder on Ancient Voglet, just nothing happens. So like it sort of gave you an extra sink for your Marilorns. Which is kind of a big deal. Fork Ligon applies while some of the most broken effects in MTG are, eight, are symmetrical effects. Yeah, because you have a way to break the symmetry. It's the same way in every game. That's why like uh, if you're familiar with Yu-Gi-Oh, stuff like Vanity's Emptiness or Royal Oppression or Imperial Order. All these cards are technically symmetrical, but because you can build your deck and you can choose when to play the cards, you have ways of breaking that symmetry. 
Ah, Nilfgaard's next. Necker. Uh, if there's less control, this card's sick, right? The problem is right now, everyone's playing Forktail, everyone's playing, like, Arcuspore, everyone's playing ways they can deal with these efficiently. Uh, the Scoia'tael Archer, which just deals two split however you want. A Mastercrafted Spear, Croc, Ifne. But man, when this guy sticks and your opponent doesn't answer either of them, you're very easily getting like 8 to 10 points easy on your 4 provision card. But sometimes you just get two, and that's not good enough when you consider the other cards that you could be playing instead. Arcuspore. I think this is a contender for the best bronze in the game. The worst case on this card gets you five for your four. The best case, it lives for a little while, and then you eventually trigger the death wish on your own. And it gets like between, what, like eight and eleven? This card's so good. And it's a four. It's a four. I wouldn't change it. I love that it exists. But it's definitely very, very strong. We should make Necker immune. They definitely should not make Necker immune. Other contenders should rest bronze. Uh, I'd put, like, Forktail in there. I'd probably put Magna Division in there, honestly. Uh, Skirmisher... Uh, Blue Stripe Commando, I think, is up there. Though that's a little bit. Probably a little bit pushing it. Probably Mangonel, yeah. I don't think Mangonel is better than Magna Division, though. Like, a lot of Mangonel's power comes from Morvran. It's probably something in Scoia'tael that's really good, too. Scoia'tael just has, like, really good average cards. It's less that they're, like, super powerful on their own. And more that they're just, like, all really good. Yeah, those are the ones that come to mind, at least. Anyway, so we're about to move on to Nilfgaard. Before we do, though... Oh, okay, yeah. Before we do, though, I'm going to take a quick restroom break. I'll be right back in, like, two minutes. And we'll begin with the leaders, and then move on to the big golds. Hope you guys stick around. <laughs> 